G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Ezekiel. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thanks for coming along. We're into session seven of the Book of Ezekiel. We're going to be looking from chapter nine, verse one, down to chapter 11, verse six. So, if, oh, just quickly remember the last, the last session we were looking at uh, uh, how badly they've become... Uh, in, entrenched in their idol worship we saw the the women crying for tammuz uh we, we saw also the 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 the, the, the 24 the 25 men the priests uh, turning their back upon god uh, in in worshiping the sun turning their backsides towards the holy of holies to worship the sun uh, and we saw all these things uh transpiring last session so they're this idolatry has become so bad that now the Lord has to do something. And what we're going to see here now, we're going to see, we see the man with the ink horn. He comes along in verses uh, uh, 1 to 11. So after being shown these four kinds of idolatrous, idolatrous worship within the temple compound in chapter 8 and having announced the coming judgment at the end of, of the chapter, Ezekiel now is about to see in chapter 9 a very graphic demonstration of what this judgment is going to mean. Now, what we see here is that uh, in verse 1, there's a call for executioners. Then he cried in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause ye them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. So Ezekiel, he, he hears a loud voice, which indicates that this revelation is going to be very graphic. And there's a call to those who have charge over the city, and they are to report every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. So this call is going out to, lit to, to literal civic officers of Jerusalem. It's not going out to them, sorry, but it is going to the angelic beings who have been appointed to carry out God's will concerning the city of Jerusalem. Now, in verse 2, they respond, Behold, Six men came from the way of the upper gate, which lieth toward the north. Every man with his slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man in the midst of them clothed in linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood before the brazen altar. Now, Ezekiel sees these six men, or, or they're actually angels, coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north. Now, this is the northern outer gate, which he also referred to back in chapter 8. It was called the upper gate when it was built by Jotham in 2 Kings 15, verse 35. 2 Kings 15, 35. There it is there on your screen. Now, it was the main gate on the north side. It's also called the gate of Benjamin in Jeremiah 20, verse 2. Because Why? Because it faced toward the territory of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, at that time, in Ezekiel's day, it was uh, it was the newest gate. It was also called the new gate. Uh, Jeremiah 26, uh, 10 and Jeremiah 36, 10 tells us that. Now, from this particular gate, Ezekiel sees the six executioners coming. Now, it's no accident that they come from the north rather than from some other direction, because when the judgment of God literally falls, where does it come from? It comes from the north as the Babylonian armies invade into the land. So what he sees is each of these men has a slaughter weapon in his hand. A slaughter weapon is, is a battle axe. All right, It's a battle axe, which we use to kill people. It's in the hand of each one of these executioners. Now, along with these six men with these battle axes in their hand, there's another very unique man. He is clothed in linen. Now, angelic beings who were clothed in linen were leading angels of a higher rank. Uh, and we find a similar one, probably the, could possibly be the same one, actually, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5. Daniel 10, verse 5. Now, in the rabbinic tradition, the Talmud says that this particular being is Gabriel. It says by his side, or actually dangling in front of him was a writer's ink horn. An ink horn was just a small case which carries pens or, or the writing instruments, ink and a knife. 
to cut the 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 uh, the papyra or, or or the scroll. In fact, the the uh, New American Standard Bible translates it as a writing case. So those three things: the pen, the ink, and the knife were the tools of a scribe. So these six men with battle axes and one with the ink horn came in and they stood where? They stood right beside the brazen altar. This means they went and stood beside the altar of sacrifice. And then in verses three to seven, they're given a command now to go and to mark and to destroy. Along with these six men, we have this... <laughs> Double up here. So we have... We have we have the one man here in the midst of them clothed in linen, right? So he's a leading angel. Did I just do that? Did I just double up? No. It's all right. I, I, I've just read slide 80, 186 in the previous slide. Okay. So they're standing beside the brazen altar, and we now have the command to mark and destroy in verses 3 to 7. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon it was, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And Jehovah said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry over all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. So before the command to mark and destroy is given, the Shekinah glory begins to move. Remember, the Shekinah glory is in the Holy of Holies above the cherub. Now, suddenly it rises from the cherub over which it was stationed. In the Holy of Holies itself, it, 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 uh, it was between the two cherubs that overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant. And this was its normal position according to Numbers chapter 7, verse 89. Numbers 7, verse 89. But now it moves to the threshold of the house, meaning it went over to the front entry of the temple building. And this is going to happen twice. First time is here in chapter 9. Second time is in chapter 10. The first time it happens is for the purpose of giving Ezekiel a revelation of the coming destruction on Jerusalem. The second time it happens in chapter 10 is the first step in its four steps of the Shekinah's final departure from the temple. So this movement here is not, is not that of the departure, but that of passive judgment. At this point, it's just a movement for, for the purpose of revelation. All right. It's a, but it's a prelude to the final departure. Now, once the Shekinah glory has moved to the temple door, a call is then issued to the one who was clothed in linen and carrying the writing case or the inkhorn. So in verse 4, this angel is now given a commission to go through the midst of Jerusalem and put a make a mark upon the foreheads of certain specific men. These would be the few remaining faithful men that sigh and that cry over all the abominations of idolatry which are going on there in the temple compound. So this, these are the believing remnant. Literally, the uh, Hebrew says he's to make a tav, T-A-V. Now, tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the modern Hebrew alphabet is, of course, the Aramaic alphabet. But in the ancient Hebrew script, the tav was actually in the form of a cross. Unfortunately, uh, our Christian commentaries or commentators have made a great deal of this, and many have thought they saw, you know, proto-Christianity proto here, but but it's not so. That it just happens to be how the letter was written in ancient Hebrew. Uh, there was no intention here to to predict the cross, and we we can't read things back into it like that. Uh, it's just one of the coincidences of history, probably. Now, immediate purpose of the mark is clear. It was to protect the believing remnant from the divine judgment that's coming. Those guys with the battle axes uh, and the rabbis, they had a lot of fun with this verse. According to them, it was not just the believing ones, but everyone had the mark put on them. Uh, and they say it just meant different things. Uh, they said the tav mark was put on the righteous ones to indicate uh, thou shalt live on the unrighteous, un unrighteous ones. It represented uh, thou shalt die. Uh, 
But if we stick to the text here, it's very clear that only the righteous receive the mark. Purpose of the mark was to protect their life. Now, another person in the Old Testament had a mark put on him to protect his life was Cain. In the New Testament, 144,000 Jewish witnesses during the tribulation will also have a mark put on their forehead to protect their life so that they cannot be killed during the tribulation. And Revelation chapter 7 tells us that. Now, I've got to close my door. I can hear, I can hear the, the TV outside. <laughs> back now once that has been done once the mark has been done in verses five to seven the six others now receive their commission and to the others he said in my hearing go ye through the city after him after the guy marks their foreheads and smite let not your eyes spare neither have ye pity slay utterly the old man the young man and the virgin and little children and women but come not near any man upon whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the old men that were before the house. And he said unto them, defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and they smote in the city. Now, here we have, we get two commissions here. First is in verse five. And then the first part of verse six. Need to go through the city following the, the man with the ink horn, and there they must begin to smite. So all those who have been marked, they're safe. They'll start striking down and kill all who do not have the mark on them. And they're not to have pity in anyone. Let, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. So the old men, the young men, the virgin women, children, all have to suffer total destruction. But a limitation is placed here. They can only touch those who do not have the mark. And the starting point for this slaughter is to be my sanctuary. That's where the idolatry was most rampant, at the temple. At the end of verse 6, they start carrying out this commission. Then they began at the old men, or, or, or better, the elders who were standing before the house, before the temple. In verse 7, they're given the second commission to defile the house with the slain. The slain are going to be found in both the outer and inner courts of the temple compound. Remember, um, uh, one was considered to have been defiled if one touched a dead body. But here you're going to have dead bodies all over the temple compound, which in effect, under the law of Moses, would defile the entire area. And at the end of verse 7, they carry out their commission, and there is death everywhere. Now, Ezekiel is watching all, all of this. And then in verse 8, he makes an intercession and a plea. And it came to pass, while they were smiting and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord Jehovah, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy wrath upon Jerusalem? So as Ezekiel is able to observe all this in his vision, because remember, he's, he's in vision here, he gets very shaken up and he makes a plea. Ah, Lord Jehovah, this is, this is an exclamation asking God, are you going to destroy all that's left of Israel as you pour out your wrath? Now, God's going to answer him in verses 9 to 10, and he's going to point out the absolute necessity of this kind of judgment. This is the answer. Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of resting of judgment. For they say, Jehovah has forsaken the land, and Jehovah sees not. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will bring their way upon their head. So in verse 9, God states the necessity of the judgment. The iniquity of both houses, that's the, the Israel and Judah, is exceeding great. He has just been so, shown this throughout chapter 8. And so as a result, the land is full of blood. Now, where the worship, 
wherever the worship of God degenerates, idolatry grows. And then what follows idolatry is immorality, violence, and murder. So the city is full of resting. It's full of perverseness or perversion, striving against God's moral law. And the evidence of this perversity is found in what the leaders are saying. Jehovah has forsaken the land. Jehovah sees not. They've completely misinterpreted the judgments of God, which came with the first and second deportations to Babylon. They assumed that both were only possible because that God had departed from them. But that was not the problem. The problem was that they had departed from God by their own sin. So they have misinterpreted the previous judgments as being proof of God's absence. They're about to realize that God had not departed from them at all. And again, we see in verse 10, he repeats the fact that this judgment is going to be without mercy. Mine eye will not spare, neither will I have pity. Now, of course, uh, the reason is not because God takes any pleasure in bringing about this kind of judgment. He is simply bringing their own way upon their head. They are reaping what they've sown. They're reaping the dreadful results of what they have already sowed. We're going to see the report in verse 11. This is the man in, in clothed in linen. And behold, the man clothed in linen who had the inkhorn by his side reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. The chapter now ends with the report that comes from the leading angel in verse 11. As God finished explaining to Ezekiel why this judgment was necessary, the man with the inkhorn has now returned. His part of the job is finished. All those who are to be spared have been marked. The other six are still doing the work of execution. Again, we have to remember that this is not literally happening at this point. Okay, Ezekiel is only seeing a vision of what is going to happen later on. The slaughter that has been carried out by these angels in the vision will later be done by the literal armies of Babylon. But there will be marked men who will be spared because God will see to it that no one kills them. So, a bit of a summary. Chapter 8 is concerned with the reason for the departure of the Shekinah glory. And that was the four kinds of gross idolatry going right with, on right within the temple compound. It was bad enough that idolatry was being practiced all over the country. But there was this massive idolatry right there in the temple compound itself. Perhaps it was epitomized by the fact that even the priests were there with their backs to the temple and facing towards the east, worshipping the sun, S-U-N, instead of worshipping God. Then in chapter 9, Ezekiel uh, saw a graphic vision of what was going to happen when the judgment finally struck. There would be a massive slaughter, and only those who had received an invisible mark in their forehead would be spared. What would permit the slaughter to take place in chapter 9 would be the departure of the Shekinah glory in chapters 10 and 11. In the next segment, which is, which is, is going to be uh, point 4, we come to the stage. We come to the stages of the departure from chapter ten, verse one, right down to chapter eleven, verse twenty-five. And in this section, he now shows how the Shekinah glory departed from Israel in four successive stages. Now we're going to look at the first stage in, in chapter ten, verses one to eight. Verses one to two deal with the coals of fire over Jerusalem. Now, uh, verse 1 describes the appearance. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was over the head of the cherubim, there appeared above them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So here again, we have the appearance of the Shekinah glory described in, in, in similarity to the form of a sapphire stone. And in the first part of verse 2, we have the commission to the one being addressed. And he spake unto the man clothed in linen and said, Go in between the whirling wheels, even onto the cherub. 
and fill both thy hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. So those coals of fire are found within the square of the four cherubs. Remember, there's a, a square in the middle of them. He's to take the coals of fire and then he's told to scatter them over the city. This is the city of Jerusalem. And he went then in my sight. He goes to do the job. Now, in verses 3 to 5, we see the movement of the Shekinah glory. Now, the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. And the glory of Jehovah mounted up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of Jehovah's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even to the outer court as the voice of God Almighty when he speaketh. So verses 3 to 5 describe the movements of the Shekinah glory. Remember, the Shekinah glory is a visible manifestation of the presence of God. Verse 3 identifies the initial position of the cherubim. The cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. So the cloud was another manifestation of the Shekinah glory. In, in, the, second, in the first part of verse 4, there's a transfer. And the glory of Jehovah mounted up from the cherub. So this marks the first position of the Shekinah glory, in that it was over the cherubim within the Holy of Holies. And the text then states, and it stood over the threshold of the house. So this marked the second position of the Shekinah glory, and it was now standing at the doorway of the temple building itself. And the second part of verse 4 describes the results both on the interior and exterior. Concerning the interior, the house, this was the temple, was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of Jehovah's glory. So the exterior, the court was full of the brightness of Jehovah's glory. The Shekinah glory brightness shone from outside into the temple courtyard, since the Shekinah glory was now at the doorway of the temple building. Verse 5 then proceeds to give us the accompanying phenomenon with the movement from the first position to the second position of the Shekinah glory. The sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even to the outer court. So along with this dazzling brightness was the sound of the cherubim's wings, so loud that it was heard in the outer court. Yeah, you can, If you go back to chapter 1, verse 24, uh, and, and read on from there, this gives us the, uh, a, a, better, a bit of a, more of an explanation, which we covered before. So now he gives us two points of similarity with, with what happened previously. First, as the voice of God when speaks, when he speaks, and second, the sound of rolling thunder. That's what it sounds like, the, 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 the wings of the cherubim. Now here we go. So we've, we've gone from the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah glory has now moved from the Holy of Holies, which is inside there, and it's now in the first stage of the departure, the Shekinah glory, it moved from the Holy of Holies to the threshold or the doorway of the temple building. So that's where we are now. In, in this section from uh, verse 3 to 5 of chapter 10. Now, verses 6 to 8, we have the receiving of the coals of fire. And it came to pass when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, take fire from between the whirling wheels, from between a cherubim, that he went in and stood beside a wheel. And the cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubim onto the fire that was between the cherubim, and took thereof, and put it into the hands of him that was clothed in linen, who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubim the form of a man's hand under their wings. So here in verse 6, the commission is given to the man clothed in linen. Remember, he, he, you remember he's, he was a leading angel. He stood out to go in and stand beside one of the wheels. Actually, uh, verse 6 is picking up from where verse 2 left off, okay? Verse 2 of chapter 10. We first saw the man in verse 2, then in verses 3 to 5, he began dealing with the first stage of the departure. Now in verse 7, he receives the coals of fire. 
Yeah, so one of the cherubs stretches out his hand from between the other three cherubim. Remember, there's four of them uh, around uh, the, the throne or, or make the, the base for the throne or from within the, the hollow square which where he's put his hand, which they formed. He reaches out to the fire and he now takes some of it in the form of coals and puts it in this man's hands. He then took these coals and he went out. This is the, the man in linen, went out. Purpose of his going out, as we, as we know from verse 2, was to scatter the coals of fire over the city. So the hand of the cherub was in the form of a man's hand. And that's, that's the, the hand that gave uh, the burning coals to the, the man in linen. Yeah. The cherubim we see in verses 9 to 17. Uh, this, this it deals with it. Now, verses 9 to 14, he deals with their appearance. And I looked, this is Ezekiel, and I looked and behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside one cherub, another wheel beside another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like unto a beryl stone. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been within a wheel. When they went, they went in their four directions. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed. They turned not as they went. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, they were called in my hearing the whirling wheels. Everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of the cherub, Second face was the face of a man. Third face, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. Now, most of these statements are, are simply repetitions of what we did back in chapter one. So if you want to fully understand this some more, go back to, back to chapter one. We won't do it again here. A couple of things different here, though, which we need to mention. In verses nine and 10, he deals with the wheels again. Yes, nothing new uh, that can be discerned here. It's, it's the same as chapter one. Two wheels dissecting each other at right angles so that they can travel in all four directions without having to be steered. They just go straight. So the point is made again in verse 11 that did not have to turn as they went. Okay? The new information is given in verse 12, though. Whereas in chapter 1, we were told that only the rims of the wheels were full of eyes, now we learn that their whole body, including their backs, hands, wings, and the wheels, were full of eyes round about. Remember, in Scripture, in both the Old and New Testaments, when something is said to be full of eyes, it signifies both the omniscience and the omnipresence of God. He sees everything and he knows everything. Why? Because he's everywhere. In verse 13, the wheels are called the whirling wheels. We've also seen them earlier, but there's a bit of a new information here in verse 14. It's a slight variation of what we're told about the cherubim in chapter 1. Each of these cherubs had four faces. In chapter 1, these were the face of a man, of an ox, of a lion, and of an eagle. In this passage, we have the repetition of the man, the lion, and the eagle. But in place of the face of an ox, in, in verse 14, we have the face of a cherub. So this corresponds to the face of an ox in chapter 1, verse 10. So this seems to indicate that the primary identifying feature of a cherub is the face of an ox. The most prominent tended to be the man's face, because that always faced outwards. As far as its primary look is concerned, it appears to be that of an ox. This is a cherub. And there are actually two types of cherubs. Uh, the ones we're dealing with here are cherubs that have four wings and four faces. Now, there's another type of cherub which has two wings, two faces. Remember, uh, Satan was a cherub. Remember, he was a cherub. He was the arch cherub. Uh, it, but we don't know which type he was, whether he had uh, four wings or two wings. We don't know. Or four faces and two faces. It's probably two-faced. <laughs> now, in verses 15 to 17, Ezekiel describes their actions. And the cherubim mounted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chabar, back in chapter 1. 
And when the cherubim went, the wheels went beside them. And when the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the wheels also turned and not from beside them. So when they stood, these stood. And when they mounted up, these mounted up with them. And the spirit of the living creature was in them. So as far as their actions are concerned, this is information we've already been given back in chapter one. And therefore, nothing particularly new in what Ezekiel is saying here. Now, verse 15 describes the start of their movements. Verses 16 to 17 emphasizes the movements of the wheels themselves uh, and the details of these various phases. Uh, again, uh, back in chapter one, we, we did a lot of this stuff. Okay. Now we come to the second stage in verses 18 to 19. This is the second stage of the Shekinah glory's departure. And the glory of Jehovah went forth from over the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight when they went forth. And the wheels beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of Jehovah's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. In verse 18, once again, we read of the second position where the Shekinah glory had moved to earlier. The glory of Jehovah was standing over the threshold of the house, meaning at the door of the temple building itself. Now, in verse 19 comes the transfer. Again, the cherubs begin to set their wings in motion and they fly up above the earth. And as they move, the wheels move with them over to their third position, which is over against the door of the east gate of Jehovah's house. This means they have arrived at the east gate in the outer wall. This is a third stage in the departure from Israel. The third, well, it's, a, it's the third step in the departure from Israel. Third position, sorry, in the departure. This is the second stage, but this is the third position. So Shekinah, the Shekinah has now moved from the threshold or the doorway of the temple building to the east gate in the outer wall. Uh, and this is the third position in the departure. Remember, he moved from the Holy of Holies uh, to the doorway, uh, to, 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 sorry, uh, from, from the threshold or the doorway of the temple building to the east gate in the outer wall. So he's he's gradually moving away from the temple. Uh, and this is the, the third position we see here at the east gate in the departure from Israel. Now, the identity of the cherubim in verses 20 to 22. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river Chabar, and I knew that they were cherubim. Everyone had four faces, everyone had four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings. And as for the likeness of their faces, they were the faces which I saw by the river Chabar. Their appearances and themselves, they went everyone straight forward. So here we have a, in verse 20, we have a clear identification that the living creature is a cherub. Ezekiel has not been looking at a spaceship or, or the chariot of the gods, uh, which was which was quite popular back in the, I don't know, it was the 70s, I think it was, chariots of the gods, von Daniken. Now, purely and simply, it is a cherub. Uh, what he was seeing were cherubs who were bearing the Shekinah glory. And now, in spite of uh, rabbinical commentaries that try to get away from the fact that this is God himself, Ezekiel clearly states the four creatures that he saw underneath the firmament, which was underneath the throne, and which had the likeness of the appearance of a man sitting up, up, upon it above. That's what we saw back in chapter 1, verse 26. Here he says, here he says, all this I saw under the God of Israel. Right? So once again, this demonstrates the Shekinah glory is the visible manifestation of God himself. The prophet here, Ezekiel, is at pains to let us know that this is exactly the same thing he saw in his first vision by the river Kebar in, in, in the very beginning back in chapter 1. In verse 21, he, he once again, he gives a general description, which is obviously describing the same thing he saw in chapter 1. Four faces, four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man under their wings. Now, chapter 22, concerning their faces, he says they're the same as those he saw in chapter 1, but he notes once more that when they go, they always move straight forward. Now, in chapter 11, verses 1 to 12, 
We see the story of the departure. It continues here. We're introduced to another scene, which once again explains what is necessary for the Shekinah glory to depart even further away than it is so far. Up to this point, it has gone out of the temple itself, out of the inner court, and is now standing over the east gate between the outer court and the outside of the temple compound. But at least in that sense, it is still within the city. Now, does it need to depart any further? The answer is yes. And the reasons for it are to be given in verses 1 to 12. Here we see the cauldron and the flesh. In verses 1 to 4, we are again introduced to 25 men. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of Jehovah's house, which looketh eastward, and behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men. And I saw in the midst of them Jazaniah, the son of Azor, and Pelatiah, the son of Beniah, princes of the people. And he said unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise iniquity and that give wicked counsel in this city, that say, the time is not near to build houses. This city is a cauldron, we are the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. Now, in verse 1, Ezekiel is transported so that he too is now brought over to the same spot to which the Shekinah glory had moved. He's by the east gate of the outer wall. And once again, he sees 25 men standing at the gate. Now, these are not the same 25 men we saw back in chapter 8, verse 16. They're different. They were elders of the people whereas these were princes of the people or civil rulers. There are two leaders among them. One is Jazaniah. Now, uh, although he has the same name as the man in chapter 8, verse 16, this is not the same person because this Jazaniah has a different father. Their second, Azor is his father. Their second leader was Pelatiah, the son of Beniah. So these two were the leaders among the 25 men. These were the ones responsible for giving other people advice, to give counsel and civic leadership to the city. They were supposed to be giving wise counsel and leadership. They were supposed to be examples of those who knew how to use and apply wisdom, but that was not what was happening here. Their sin is described in verses 2 to 3. Verse 2 tells us what they did and verse 3 what they said. What they did was to devise iniquity. The word devise means to plan carefully. They used their wisdom to carefully plan and devise iniquity. Instead of giving wise counsel, they gave wicked counsel to the city. So in that sense, they had prostituted their position. Now, one example of the kind of advice we are given is in verse 3. The time is not near to build houses. Now, we cannot be absolutely sure what that means, but there are two possibilities here. First, they could be saying, this is not the time to be building private homes. Rather, it is a time to prepare for war because God wants us to rebel against Babylon. So that's the first possibility. Second possibility is that these words were intended to actually contradict the counsel of Jeremiah the prophet who was ministering back in Jerusalem at this time. In Jeremiah 29 verses 1 to 7, Jeremiah wrote a letter to those who had already gone into exile in Babylon in the first and second deportations. He told the exiles not to believe the false prophets who were saying that they would soon return to Jerusalem because their captivity was going to continue for 70 years. So the exile, so he wrote the exiles and he says the exile's responsibility was to settle down in, in Babylonia because you're going to be there for 70 years, build homes, marry, raise children, work in the land, work the land in Babylonia. It could be that these leaders here who, who are in uh, Babylonia are contradicting Jeremiah's advice uh, by saying, uh, this is not the time to build houses. We're going to rebel against Babylon and once we defeat Babylon with the help of the Egyptians, then the Babylonian exiles will be able to return to their own land. Uh, sorry, these guys are, are down in, in, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem because that's where Ezekiel has been transported to. So what he's saying, it's foolish now 
to build houses in Babylonia because we won't be here for very long. So the phrase, the time is not near to build houses, could have either of these two meanings. First, don't build, build houses now in Jerusalem, prepare for war instead. Or second, uh, do not build houses now in Babylonia because you'll soon be returning uh, to um, Israel, to Jerusalem. Then another example of what they're saying, what they were saying is, this city is the cauldron and we are the flesh. Now, the point they're making is that they were safe in the cauldron. Now, the cauldron, which is a, a big a steel pot, uh, protected the meat from burning. And their thinking was that Jerusalem was just like this huge cauldron, which would protect its inhabitants from destruction. And once again, we see here the basis for their false sense of security was what happened over a hundred years earlier with the Assyrians. Remember, uh, the Shekinah glory was still resident within the temple back then. And because the temple was still standing in Jerusalem, they thought they were invincible and the city was indestructible. So they say here again, Jerusalem is like a cauldron that's going to protect us from any destruction. It won't happen here because the temple is here and this is where God dwells in the temple. Now, oh, wow. Because of this sin in what they do and what they say in, in verse 4, Ezekiel is commanded to prophesy against them. Therefore, uh, because of verses 2 to 3, prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. The word prophesy here is used twice like this to make it emphatic. And this is what Ezekiel does. And then in verses 5 to 12, we have the prophecy of judgment. The spirit of Jehovah fell upon me and he said unto me, speak. Thus says Jehovah, thus have you said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied, you are slain in this city and you have filled the streets thereof with the slain. So in verses 5 to 12, Ezekiel follows out what he was told to do in verse 4, which was to prophesy judgment. And at this point, as a prophet, he is given full inspiration by the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jehovah fell on him. It fell upon him so that he could give forth a prophetic utterance, which was the very words of God himself. Now in verses, the second part of verse 5 and verse 6, he clearly described what their sin is. Thus have you said, O house of Jerusalem. So what they said was recorded in verses 2 to 3. And God is very aware of what is going on in their minds. That was the point of the cherubim being full of eyes. In every aspect of their being, God sees and God knows all that goes on in every place. Their works in verse 6 have been in multiplying your slain in this city, and you have filled the streets thereof with the slain. So they were guilty of multiple murders, and the kind of counsel they were giving out in verses 2 to 3 would only bring on divine judgment, which would itself cause slaughter in the streets of Jerusalem. Now, I've ended it here because... Uh, the next section I want to do in one hit. So thank you for coming along. Study hard and grow strong.